So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Michael, we've invited you here to kind of talk through, you know, you, you've had huge budgets, huge teams, but also huge attack surfaces and huge complexities. You know, I kind of wanted to get, you know, your perspective, have everyone kind of learn from you and kind of talk through some of the challenges and, and complexities you faced historically. Also some background about you and, uh, you know, some of the things that we've been talking about, you know, off the webinar kind of about machine learning and how the AI revolution and all of those things may be changing and becoming more necessary as, as time goes on. Yeah, definitely. I'm happy to uh, jump in with a little bit of background on myself and um, Adam will take this conversation in a few different directions. Yeah, uh, but thanks everyone for listening. Uh, throughout the years, um, I was in a few different, very interesting positions. After spending uh, six, eight years finding flaws and vulnerabilities in systems, networks, applications, I wanted to tackle the challenge of defending an organization from the introduction of such flaws. Um, I made my way out to Silicon Valley um, and started leading web security at Mozilla. I did that for a number of years, uh, helped protect over uh, 500 million users. Uh, we launched the first web security bounty program. Uh, there was bounty programs beforehand, but we launched the first web security one. Um, eventually took over all of security for Mozilla, which was an interesting challenge when we thought about um, infrastructure, BYOD uh, in 2010, uh, before that was really a bigger thing. Uh, protecting mobile operating system, um, and more. Um, I spent a little bit of time in the startup world with a company called Shape Security, if you encountered it, and ultimately um, only left there because Twitter said they needed a CISO. And so I joined as their first chief information security officer in 2014. Uh, so the company was public then, um, maybe 5,000-ish employees um, pre-today's uh, new ownership, so a different world. Um, but Still a very, very interesting place. Um, when I joined Twitter, and we'll talk more about this as we go, some people still wonder, like, why would you join a social media company like this? Like, who cares if someone's tweeting about having a ham sandwich? Uh, and that's very true. A lot of people do talk about such You're things. Right. Those were those were the the initial. I remember like the initial tweets, like back when I first joined Twitter, were just like, "Hey, I'm at this bar. Hey, look at the sandwich yep. I got." Exactly. You know, <laughs> yep, yep, totally, totally. And so there is, there's a huge, huge number of people that yeah. use it for things that are um, mundane, um, perhaps interesting to some, uh, maybe the uh, the deep sandwich crowd. But um, on the other hand, it's also a platform for free speech um, across the world. And that can uh, run into some opposition depending on where in the world. And then just to round out what I've uh, been doing, I started a company of my own. Um, it's called Altitude Networks. I co-founded that. Um, and we were focused on data security and SaaS environments, a very interesting space. And then ultimately that was acquired by CoinList. And so I am at CoinList and I uh, serve in a few different roles there from engineering, cybersecurity to venture. And one other thing that we may dive into along the way, uh, there's a wonderful nonprofit organization that helps share information far and wide to anyone that wants to know about application security. It's called OWASP, O-W-A-S-P. It helped me greatly as I learned my skills 15, 20 years ago, and I gave back volunteering there. I was the uh, chairman of the board for a number of years. I started a project called App Sensor. Great organization, great people. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, happy, is Adam. Where, where should yeah. we go? Where should we go? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, no, I, OWASP is near and dear to my heart. And as, as, as someone that's been protected by you for years in different organizations, thank you. Uh, <laughs> It's it's interesting, right? Um, so I'm I'm you know the U.S. based CTO for Reveal Security, and I also I think a lot of people in security get their starts similar to how how, how we both did, being more offensively minded. And I think because that's that's more of like the the cool right aspect of it, right? Is it's what draws people, you know, hacking the Gibson. But at the same time, I think that as we as we progress, right. There's some of us choose to go more, how can I make a difference to protect people? And I think, you know, you have some real experience and we'll talk about that a little bit, you know, as you kind of alluded to a little bit with, with the, the Twitter piece, right? Um, you know, it, it's a, how do we make a real difference in the world protecting people on the more defensive side, right? And that's, that's very interesting. I think, one of the things that I, I kind of want to get your perspective on, and this is something that you know people have been asking me about. I got asked about. I was in a you know 
on my way to RSA, I got asked in uh, in an airport lounge from a, a retail executive, are people in cybersecurity worried about all this chat GPT AI stuff, right? And, you know, I, I thought about it for a minute, you know, and I, I kind of want to get your perspective, right? But, you know, it's, it, it's a uh, worry is not the right word, right? I think there's some interesting applications and use cases, but it's not like suddenly someone's going to say, like, let me hack coin list by asking chat GPT how to do it, right? So I, I kind of just, you know, and, and we're going to kind of get into, and, you know, again, the subject of the webinar is, you know, how, how budget can be a factor, but also budget's not, you know, the, the, the most important thing and how you use resources, right? So AI, model, machine learning. So I kind of want to get your opinion and then, you know, we'll kind of riff on that a little bit because I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, what your thoughts are. When I think about how AI has evolved dramatically and it's, you know, front and center use case, which many people see as chat GPT. And of course, it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the most consumer friendly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I think about that from the adversary's perspective, or maybe even myself as a defender of a corporation, I don't know if it fundamentally changes the game. And the reason I think that is that the way people break into companies is by finding the thing we know we should have done and finding the place where we missed it, or maybe the place where we missed it the one time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think additional intelligence is what's going to give the attackers the edge. I mean, what they're doing already is automatically and systematically scanning all services, all devices. Um, they're automatically phishing um, their adversary, uh, sorry, their victims. Yeah. Um, they're easily developing phishing pages that get past the normal use of two-factor, meaning like OTP. Yeah. And none of that necessarily gets better with AI today. Um, I, always, I already think we're in a pretty dire position and this doesn't necessarily make yeah. it exponentially worse. Yet. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll get yes. <laughs> Maybe in three years, we're going to look back at this video and say, oh, well, that was not the thing you uh, said. So but, I, I, I guess, you know, think about this, right? Do you think that the current iteration of people who are benefiting most from AI on the offensive side are, well, you know, we just call them script kitties. Are we going to call them like AI kitties or something, you know, like, like chat GPT kitties, right? I, but I think from the defensive side, you know, it, it's more interesting, right? Because on the defensive side, you know, like a bunch of, um, you know, RSA was last week, not to, not to date this too much, right? But RSA was last week and a number of announcements came out. And one of them was like, am I safe from APTs from China? Is like a question someone wants to ask chat GPT, right? And it's like, how, in my opinion, that's right. And that, that that's an unanswerable question, right? So I, what you know, and that, that's I think kind of where the the marketing and the and reality kind of fall apart on the on these things, you know. Yeah, and I actually think we have some of the biggest gains to be made from AI on the defensive side, because the the fundamental challenge of defense is not being smarter or more clever. We're not getting outsmarted. We're getting outmaneuvered because we have a massive amount of information we need to be thinking about all the time. We need to analyze. This system is connected to this system. This person has access here, there, and over there. And we need to be able to process all of that. And the state of the art for 30-something years has been have a SIM, have a ton of humans, pay a ton of money in uh, data processing, and yeah. hope those humans can process stuff quick enough. Um, that's where I think AI is going to help us dramatically, uh, is bringing computers to the defenders. Yeah, and, and so I, I think that's a, a good segue, I think, into, you know, one of the things that we were talking about is back when you were at Twitter, right, I, I, I don't believe budget was a huge concern for you, given the, the how visible and how much of the reputation is tied to, to stock price and vice versa and those kinds of things when you're in that kind of space, you know, um, given that, I mean, you, could, you had your pick of top engineers in threat detection or detection engineering, threat intel, you know, SOC analysts, you best EDR, you know, experts in the world in your in your space. The what we you know, um, do you even then, right? To kind of bring it back to the the the, the budget budget based on this, do, do you think that that was effective enough? Like, could you have written the rules that you feel like you needed to write to to accomplish what you can do with machine learning or or AI in this context? 
We certainly had a good number of resources. We had amazing talent. There's the, the people there were fantastic, and we were able to get the best. Uh, that's for sure. We also didn't have unlimited uh, budget. We went through, you know, two constrictions during the time I was there, two uh, layoffs um, as they adjusted to you know, different market factors. Sure. Uh, and we had some interesting challenges. The one was that anything we wanted to do on platform had to essentially be real time. Uh, so the notion of having a uh, event fire into a sim and a human look at it an hour later was largely worthless. Um, instead, we had to programmatically add any sort of defense uh, into the platform so it could operate in real time, you know, in tens of milliseconds. And so that's where we spent engineering effort focused on, cool. on that element. Um, on the other hand, we had a pretty expansive technology base and we were a rapidly growing public startup, a conglomerate yeah. of startups, <laughs> you know, 4,000, 5,000 people with various yeah. different pieces of technology everywhere and things flying. And even at Mozilla 10 years earlier, you know, I learned very quickly what it was like to do security in Silicon Valley. There was no big gates where you would say, we're going to stop everything and check this before we ship code. You know, you're not going to go and tell people, you know, thou shalt not do all of these things. You could say some things can't be done. Right. Um, and so you have to really be nimble. And even with the amazing people we had, we were still building things from scratch because they didn't exist. Uh, we actually felt bad for the rest of the companies outside of maybe Silicon Valley, maybe the coast, maybe some tech epicenters, because they didn't have that engineering talent to build security solutions we needed. And we were building custom bespoke solutions to solve the most important problems. And there was still a litany of other challenges. I wish we had more and better solutions that we could buy off the shelf. Because uh, yeah. one thing, one thing a CISO will tell you is they will trade money for engineering time anytime. Like yes. we have money. Engineering time is the hardest thing to get. So here, you can solve this problem. Yeah, Take my money. that's a great point. So, so one of the things that I find has been a kind of a big shift. So, so like you know, I I've worked a lot with Silicon Valley, you know, co companies in this kind of context. You know, because you know, one of my previous roles was at Carbon Black, right? And so I'm very familiar with a lot of you know those those organizations. Now though. I think data scientists have become somehow like one of the most constrained resources because now the entire world, right? Security and otherwise are now moving towards big data. And like, you know, I know several economists who have PhDs and are not working in traditional economics fields and are working as data scientists now in terms that you wouldn't expect need PhD economists to be data scientists, right? The people we're talking to, CISOs in Fortune you know, 2000 are all that one of the, some of their first hires are data scientists because you know you can now find SOC analysts, but what do you have them do, right? And that kind of drives you know to, to your point, they, you know you can have the best talent in the world, but if they're not like able to get what they need done or they don't necessarily have the right direction, you know that that that's a huge challenge. And I think you know one of the things that's interesting to me is from your time at Twitter, you know because like previously I was also also at Mandiant, so I have, I have a lot of familiarity with nation state level things and how. Social media is a huge vector for nation states to do different things, not necessarily attack you directly, but use your platforms, right, for election stuff or otherwise, right? And so I think, you know, you and I were talking briefly, not to name who the actors were in this case, right? But even with your, your some of the, the best defensive security people in the world, you know, and, and the tooling that you wrote and everything else, you you still face challenges, right? So like I, you know, I, I'd love to hear more about how mm -hmm. the challenges of you know not only protecting, you know, I, I mean the question is like how do you protect the crown jewels when you have to give a lot of people access to the crown jewels, right? So, you know, I, I'd love to understand more about your thoughts on that. You know, definitely. Historically or traditionally, I think many people think about. Uh, the attacks from the outside. And that's probably the right place to start because when you think about the number of attackers, the number of malicious adversaries, you know, there's a good chance that the rest of the world has more than the ones that are in your company. And mm -hmm. the things we all fear are the insiders um, because the insiders are so much more difficult to catch because I think whenever anyone stops and thinks about the maturity of their program, you know, there are areas that are stronger than others. And you probably prioritize them 
to protect the outside a little bit more, uh, even though you still have to protect the inside um, considerably. But fundamentally for a business to operate, you have to trust people to do their job as it's been granted to them. Yes. So we had two different categories of, of challenges that we experienced. Um, on one hand, we had to get work done, you have to have people that can investigate issues on accounts. You have to have some number of people that can um, see information that is not otherwise public and is limited and tracked. Um, and those, those customer success, user services type people can investigate things. In that, in that power, you, you also provide some amount of trust that they're going to be viewing the accounts they're supposed to be and not others. And so one of the things that we had to build and we did uh, directly in, in my teams was basically uh, initial levels of data science to analyze the relationship graph of who they viewed and its relation to either active tickets or their personal um, social graph. Mm -hmm. um, because anyone that has worked with these types of teams will know that one of the unfortunate realities is the people that you can't trust or you find out you can't trust use their access to view uh, an ex-boyfriend, an ex-girlfriend, um, some other person where they didn't have a legitimate reason to do so. And that was an example where we had to build, you know, bespoke systems to analyze the events, to do a social graph, basically doing this data science um, to solve this problem. Because again, at the scale we're going, we couldn't just fire every alert off to a SOC analyst to say, hey, double check this and that. Like it has to be computers. Right. Um, you know, there's no questions asked. So that was one challenge that we worked through. Um, on the other hand, we had uh, a nation state insider challenge. Um, challenge would be an understatement. And this happened pretty much in the first six months that I was there when, uh, again, anyone that's taken on a new program, you're using the first few months to come up to speed, like where are the strengths, yeah. where are the weaknesses, let's build a plan, instead of just running around with their heads on fire. Um, and this information is public. I'm not sharing uh information well obviously we are, we are, we are gonna we are we are, we are not gonna say who the who the adversary was but yeah. yeah yeah and and basically what the issue was is a nation state planted an individual or coerced uh it's hard to know the, uh, the original background that was an employee that had privileged access mm -hmm. and we became aware of this by nature of uh the fbi tipping us off um that they believed through their methods, of course, that we had someone uh, working with a nation uh, inside our company, and then was given us the challenge of finding that person. So literally a, a needle in a haystack type challenge. No new CISO wants that call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, this was in the first six months. So uh, I'm aware of most of our systems. I'm aware of a lot of the strengths. I'm aware of a lot of the weaknesses. Yeah. And uh, it, it's not five years in. We're like, great, we've got this down. We've got the run book. We've, we're prepared for all these things. Or even two years down. Um, and this was where, you know, despite the resources we had, despite the systems that we had, again, coming as I was coming into things, right. we still were largely looking at um, log system, uh, logs, pulling them in uh, to spreadsheets, um, you know, automating, scripting, and, and analyzing this on the fly. We had the people to do that work, but my God, we were doing it by the seat of our pants at that time. Yeah, and, and I guess this is kind of one of those you know, it's really tricky things, right? You know, how do you identify when a trusted, you know, privileged user is doing things they're not supposed to that on the surface seem in the scope of their 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 role, right? And that's 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 a real challenge. And that's kind of you know why you know we invited you because it, it, it's one of you know we one of the things that, that we kind of think with with reveal security, right? Is you have to be able to utilize, to your point, the machine learning and the AI to supplement, you know, what your analysts are able to do. What because like, how would you write a rule? You know, let's say for example, I think in, in this case, someone was handing off information about dissidents, possibly or journalists to a, a, a foreign power. I mean, they're not in that person's social graph, right? So your 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 previous tools and logic wouldn't have found them necessarily because it wasn't someone that they're friends with, they're looking up and, and spying on, right? So this is kind of where, you know, you have to look for deviations in behavior, right? And this is where we have the concept of user journeys, which you and I have talked about, right? And that, that, that's kind of where, you know, the idea that someone's, when they're, when they're doing the thing they're being leveraged to do, whether it's for money or otherwise, 
they're probably not going to behave the exact same ways they're doing their job normally, right? And, and, and in an unruly environment are hopefully also not doing things that same way, or else you possibly have more leveraged assets and you don't necessarily realize it yet and you need to go find them, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, it, it's a real challenge. I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the thought experiments I kind of enjoy is, you know, whenever someone says they have a, a problem, like, okay, what rule would you have written for this? You know, like, it, especially in a, in a customer service or, or customer satisfaction, admin capacity, how could you possibly model that up in such a way that you have a, a rule, you know, it's... Exactly. The, you, you can write rules for the things you know to look for, but even that is still challenging to do with good coverage. And the moment you have variability based on the person, uh, that's where things get more complex. Um, and I do think that teams that are not equipped with data science, ML, AI, are going to be left behind because otherwise you're trying to solve it in uh, early 2000s era technology and approach, and you're only going to be scaling humans, which is not going to be cost effective uh, at all. And, and I agree that finding the next thing to look for is going to be surfaced from being able to analyze large amounts of data and automatically pull those signals out. Um, mm -hmm. I, I agree that also the, it tends to be that people explore what access they have um, on a smaller scale first. Exactly. They tend to- oh, yeah. No one, no, no one looked at me, no one thought I was doing. Let's, yeah. you know. Exactly, they either trip over it and realize, oh, I did this thing by mistake, I have more access or power than I realized, which obviously you wanna <laughs> keep that to a minimum as possible right. within these systems, but, but yes, they will step out of the bounds to something that they could probably say, oh, that was me doing this, something less dire. And then realizing if that can work is where they escalate then uh, in, in the future uh, to do something even more uh, malicious. Yeah, it's like my 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 seven-year-old, right? He's like, does something he's not supposed to do, just kind of looks at me, sees if I'm gonna say anything about it. And if I don't say anything about it, that's now in scope for him, you know, um, absolutely. And, and so now, I mean, in, in your current role, right? You know, social media is is one massively under attack, you know, industry. Crypto is shockingly not different, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, because now, you know, now there's real, not only I mean, there's real things involved in social media, right? There's, there's lives involved, possibly, right? But now you also have have financials involved. That you know, I, I'd love to understand more about how you view your attack surface and really how you would view, you know, how to best to augment budget and and, and your your uh, capabilities with with that under consideration. You know, one of the big challenges in the broad, you know, crypto Web three uh, space is that we've we've upped the we've upped the the game so to speak, and what could happen. Um, in the web two world, uh, you could have user data theft, um, which, is, which is bad. Um, and that could lead to horrible things. The, in the crypto web three world, the compromises can lead to instant money transfers. Um, and not that it isn't possible for financial institution was uh, compromised, of course, in the traditional web two world, but I think one of the things we need to realize is the speed of innovation that's happening between a financial institution and the rest of technology is very different. And so sure, any industry you could say, we're going to protect it like a financial institution, but you may not be innovating uh, at all. Well, you is, may ship things no, every three no years. And I see for crypto, right? There, there, right? There's no winding it back and just giving you dollars back, right? It, it's a... Uh... Right. And yeah. And then fundamentally, that's one of the other pieces is when it moves, it moves. Yeah. There's, there's not the, the stop gaps. Um, and one of the challenges in the Web3 crypto space is one, just information. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things changing every single day, but the, the, the issues I've seen that have dominated have not so much been vulnerabilities in the blockchain, the layer ones, so, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, but rather in either smart contracts, which again is the challenge of writing secure code, and sure. even more so the infrastructure around crypto, the web two 
component, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so you don't need to compromise or find a flaw in a blockchain if you can just go to a website, hack a website and change the wallet address to point to a different one. And so really where we end up is what is old is new. The challenges that we thought yeah. we could get away from are still here. There's no new technology to save us. Yeah. We've got to solve the whole kit and caboodle um, all at the same time. But, but you have 2FA. What's the problem? I don't, I don't understand. You, <laughs> you can, now I can just use one-time codes. What's the, you know, it's never mind yeah, phishing yeah. is still the, the most prevalent, you know, attack vector, you know, and, and you have no way of knowing if your authenticated users are actually your authenticated users, you know? So it's a... Uh, and not to dive too deep down the authentication rabbit hole, but if there's one other takeaway amongst the, the, the item of using use data science ML, use a FIDO UV key. Uh, like if you're going to be fished to give away your password, there's no reason you're not going to type in your six digit code right after it. Use, uh, use a UV key, FIDO uh, physical token. It is phishing proof from that regard. True. Now, and then also you have to assume that, that all the infrastructure is also secure. Because like one of the things I got asked, uh, there was a, a CISO I was talking to who said, well, you have to be on my network to utilize our SaaS apps because they have it locked down. It's like, okay, so you're, you're trusting the SaaS app's going to be perfect. And you also are assuming that there's no issues with your infrastructure. How many zero days have been reported in the last year and a half with VPNs or with firewalls? Like, Mm -hmm. especially if I was in your situation, right? With, with lots of money that was just sitting there that could be transferred, you know, irrevocably, right? Mm -hmm. I would be very concerned about the security, and I'm sure you are, right? The security of VPNs and other things you're using because you can't trust that they're perfect because now suddenly you have nation states who are willing to take advantage and burn zero days that no one's seen before on the internet. Yeah. It, it's a really good point because the way infrastructure is fundamentally changed for all modern companies. And sure, you can look at a GE, a Lockheed Martin and say, yeah. they're in a different world. Sure. The modern company is built on the web. The modern company doesn't necessarily have a data center. The office doesn't matter, let alone that right. we work from home. Uh, and so, sure, there are some companies that route all web traffic through a VPN intermediary. But there's a heck of a lot that don't, which means your infrastructure, so to speak, is everywhere. And yeah. the ability to have interconnection to all of them for authentication, access control, for monitoring, for understanding deviations in real time right. is crucial. It's a whole different ballgame. And you are not going to hire enough humans to tackle this with human power. You've got to use the power of computing, which is AKA data science ML, AI. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so we have a, a question that came in, my company only saves logs for three months. Is that a problem? We're trying to keep our costs low. I've heard this a lot. So th there's definitely a lot of, um, th there's a lot of sensitivities to cost around log storage and log maintenance, right? You know, you're in a regulated industry, you have to maintain logs for a certain amount of time. You're paying probably a SIM provider or a data science or a data center or data storage provider a lot of money for that. Um, three months is still enough to show trends and do behavioral analysis with the right machine learning, uh, the right machine learning capabilities. It's really up to what the applications are. I mean, how, how much logging do you guys store? Like, what's your what's your uh, guidelines on on storage? There's two ways to answer that question. One is regulatory requirement. And that, depending on your industry, can just immediately put it up to like seven years. And that's uh, just a cost standard, of doing right? business. It's a, yeah, that's that's a standard, yeah. yeah. So that's not uncommon. I think if you are thinking about logs from an investigation purpose, that's another question. So on one end, you've got whatever data you have to keep for a long time, which is very expensive. Um, then you say, well, what data should I keep in the event we had a breach and needed to look back into the logs. And then, I mean, I think you're seeing people say more like six, nine months um, for that kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, for purpose. And then the third category is if you want to train models with data, you don't necessarily have to store all of that data forever to do that. You can run it through the system for X amount of time and right. then stop storing that data. Uh, so I think it falls into three different camps. Um, it just depends kind of what your objectives and needs are. 
Yeah, I mean, we, what we've been seeing more of is uh, people asking us. It's like, I guess there's two parts here, right? One of them is, you know, uh, we've had a lot of questions, you know, are we in the sim business? The answer is absolutely not. Right? I, I, we don't want to be in the sim business. To your point, train our models. We need just a few pieces of data that we need to train the model. Throw away the rest that we don't need for investigation for analysts. And also the other side of that is to your point, everyone has, let's just assume a seven year window, like you're saying, right? Uh, people are storing these logs for seven years and just paying for them. And one of the things that's been helping people kind of recoup costs to some extent is showing value of those logs being stored, right? So now it's not a must, but now it's a must and we have a value being associated with actually storing them, <laughs> right? And this is where something like a, a reveal securities tracker IQ can come in. And now people can actually do some of those logs because otherwise we go back to the, the rules and threat hunting without guidance at the application layer. Like how do you know what to look for and now we can process those and do the machine learning that I think is, is very valuable, right? Um, how, how would you justify, like, you know, let, let's say you're talking to your, to your CFO or your CLO, right? And they're, you know, you, you have all these logs you're paying all this money for storing, you know, what does that mean to you? I and mean, how do you, how do, can you, is there like a, a positive if you can show you're actually using those logs versus just having to store them? It's a good question because in many cases, the security organization may be seen as a cost center. But if you can then also put that on the balance sheet of actually providing value in the camp of a security objective, um, that's going to be that's going to be pretty powerful because you're already paying the cost. You're already signed up for it. And that is then going to enhance your capabilities. And I think, again, when you're in front of the when you're in front of the board, when you're in front of the C-suite talking about your strategic program, um, if you're able to say we are leveraging best of breed, again, buzzwordy, but we're actually able to use cutting edge technology and learn from everything we have. Like that's going to send a very powerful message that, you know, you've got your ducks in a row uh, along with the rest of your program, mm -hmm. uh, but that you're really doing everything that you that you can uh, to fight the adversary. That's a great point. So, so you brought up. Uh being seen as a cost center, being seen as a, a business enabler or, or, or a value adder, right? And the idea is if you're telling, you know, your CFO or CEO, I have to store these logs, give me all this money, it's just dead, it's basically just dead budget versus I can be, you know, uh, transformational with these logs that we're kind of storing and actually more proactively protect the business in ways that you wouldn't have expected previously. Like for example, you know, if you find internal fraud, that's been going on. Now you can. Now you're not only paying for these logs, but possibly paying for them out of an out of, out of, out of a, a positive ROI because you're able to stop the internal fraud that's been happening in your organization that you were previously blind to. You know that's one of the main things. Like, for example, we have we have a. I learned this recently from talking to one of the insurance companies we're working with. Uh, they don't investigate claims under X amount of money for fraud, internal fraud, right? And mm -hmm. they have people who come in off the street with clean background checks, but are being leveraged or are affiliated with organized crime or gangs, come in and even during their training sessions, find a way to just like approve their friends' claims that are under that certain amount. And it's not until someone actually looks at them when they're going to transition from the training to normal period, that they realize that they've lost thousands of dollars to these people. Then they just fire because it's not worth their time to actually prosecute necessarily. and if you can recoup those costs because you're able to find that kind of behavior that previously wasn't worth your time because of the costs associated with that kind of thing, right? Like to your point, previously, you know, you is it, how much is it worth to you as CISO of a social media company to find a person, you know, looking at their ex, you know, ex partner's account, right? From a dollar perspective, I don't know. Right? How do you justify yeah. the cost associated with that? Right? Other than brand or hit or something? Right? Like it, it, it's a it, it's a challenge. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's a good question, and it ties back to uh, an earlier point you made. the The reason we did that was because we could do it in a cost effective way because we leveraged data science, and two, because we knew if they would violate the rules to do something like that, they would violate the rules to do something worse. And that was where there was a zero tolerance. And it literally was like, if you're looking for a policy, what you should do there, first time fired, 100%. Absolutely. Uh, I, heard, I heard this very interesting uh, stat. I knew if it's true. This could be one of those, like everyone knows the stats that's totally wrong, right? But last week someone said to me, 
you know, you should assume from an inside threat perspective for your program, 20% of your customer of your employees will never steal from you, no matter what, right? 60% might in the right conditions and 20% will no matter what, right? And if you can find that 20% doing something that's bad, but not horrific, right? Like not like the big boom, but a littler boom, right? Get them out, right? So that, that, that's a really interesting point. So I guess um, if there's any any more questions, I'm here. Otherwise, Michael, I've, I've really appreciated this this chat. It, it's good talking to you as always, and I look forward to continuing our conversations. You know. Yeah. As as people are thinking about any final questions, if any, um, I wanted to mention one last thing that you were talking about with the the cost associated with mm -hmm. uh, investigating an issue. Far too often in cybersecurity, we lock ourselves into this box of it's secure or it's not secure. And think about this absolutism. And really what it's not that like one, we know that nothing is fully absolutely secure, but two, it's risk management. And it's about is the loss worth, you know, mitigating against or fighting against. And so suddenly if you can bring in a technology and approach that can give you the ability to solve these problems that were not financially reasonable before. That alone is going to be a huge ROI in your investment. It's going to turn that investment to a positive. You're going to make the money back on that and more in addition to whatever other big rocks that you uncover. And so I, I encourage people to think about the, the financial implications of security and the risk management and how it ties to bottom line uh, for a business. And that's where you can do some really powerful things with data science. You just brought up a really good point. This, you, 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 you hinted around this previously, right? Which was... You know, people who are going to do bad things test boundaries, right? So mean time to detection, right, is driven down tremendously when you're able to apply machine learning to, to behaviors. And you can find them testing those boundaries and possibly cut them off before they do the really bad thing by either firing them, like you said, right? Or I think I know they're being watched, right? Like my seven-year-old, right? And the idea is that let's say, for example, you do have an incident and you are able to find something, and it's not just a testing of boundaries, but a, a, a small transfer of a, of, of a dollar or whatever, or a small stealing of whatever. Now you can, you, your methane detection went from, you know, down to this from an unknown amount of time. And if you have a threat actor in your network and, you know, in, in your application layer, all right, finding them before they do the, like, for example, like, you know, we, we both know, right, that incidents are not like movies where, you know, you, you know, smash and grab and within five minutes, like, oh yeah, I'm in, I, I hacked the system and I got $10 million. Like that's not how it works, right? The reality is there's tons of recon, tons of, ton, you, know, you follow the entire kill chain, right? You know, across every different layer of the, of the environment. And you want, if, assuming you can find stuff to the left, the better, right? So that's that's where we, I'm saying left, I don't know if it's left or right with the, with the cameras, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? So so the idea is that it's uh, driving down meantime detection also is a huge cost saver from a budgetary perspective, because now your IR is less expensive and you possibly have avoided losing the money in the first place or the big damaging event from actually happening. Yeah, 100%, totally agree. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I think um, that was all of our questions. You know, I, I've i thoroughly enjoyed our discussion. Uh, oh, do we have one more? Oh. So here's a question uh, for new technology and use cases, for example, chatbots powered by large language models. How do you estimate risk if the known attack vectors are still being discovered? You want to take a first shot at this? Or? Yeah, you know, you know, the way I would think about that, um, I think specifically as I think about the chatbot example. So if you're thinking of it as a uh, maybe a, a front-facing chatbot on a website for customer service, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, you're, I think it's a good point. Like we don't always know the attack vectors. There will be new things discovered in your technology. So I think you take it back to first principles and you say, what sets of data um, are uh, available here? And so that you're going to look at like, what is it connected to? Is it connected to the the full set of all user data in order to answer questions. Um, and then other questions like, well, what sort of isolation do we have? Is the things that we learn uh, isolated to a particular customer? Um, does it have the ability to learn across other customers? And then you start to say, we don't know how this could happen, but here are potential risks, such as the large amount of user data that's accessible could be exposed to another user. 
And then you're going to have to start asking questions. Like, do we have any confidence that this is going to happen or not happen? Um, if it did happen, would we know? What would our detection methods be? And so you have to step through the systematic way of looking at it. And then at the end of the day, you're going to build some sort of confidence score and how bad you think that is and what mitigations you might put in place. Um, but I think if, if you're thinking about it from a business perspective, you take that structured approach, you document it, and you have a, a good uh, approach and what you do that could be defensible as to why you ended up where you were. And if you still don't feel confident in your defensibility, bring in a third party expert to uh, validate your work. Then you've done all of the types of uh, analysis you'd expect uh, of somebody in a, in a company. So that, that's a great point. I was talking to some people recently who they, IP is one of their main concerns, right? They, they have very little user data, they have very little you know, monetary, it's just the IP. And they saw in their firewall egress logs, suddenly a huge spike in chat GPT and, and, and the like being used. And they were tied back to people who have access to that, that IP. And essentially they realized we're really you know, having an issue here because we're basically allowing people to, to you know, exfil on accident or, or, or by using a service, you know, to something that's training based on our, our data now. Right. And so, so, so to what you were saying before about how you can't just say no, they had to just say no until they could sign up for one of the siloed versions. Right. And even then you're, you're trusting that that's really siloed. There's all this trust, there's all this non-technical trust, right. That's associated with that. And then I think also to kind of go back to a little bit more about, you know, the attack vectors, you know, a lot of it's still behavioral. Right, you know, it, it, even if let's say, for example, you you do use chatbots, et cetera, with the large language models, if you can find what's anomalous in the interactions with those chatbots, that's when you start finding testing parameters and boundaries that would be indicative of a, an unknown attack vector or a known attack vector that doesn't that isn't necessarily uh, you know rules compatible. If that makes sense, you know. Yeah. And that, that you hit a great point because I guess uh, I interpreted the question as a chatbot on your website facing your consumers. And you gave the other example of a chatbot like a chat GPT that employees may use and maybe right. upload source code, et cetera. That's, that's a good point. And, and both of those you have to think about methodically and with different considerations. Absolutely. Okay. So I think that was our last question. Um, it's been... Uh, a great 45 minutes or so with you, Michael, uh, you know, and I, I enjoy our conversations. Um, I believe this will be recorded. This is being recorded as well as live stream. So hopefully people who weren't able to attend will be able to uh, enjoy the content in the future and maybe learn something from you. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I mean, these are very real challenges. It couldn't be more evident. And the thing we need to do is keep innovating and keep bringing great new approaches. So I'm really excited about what you guys are working on too. And thanks for having me. Thanks, Michael.